Hey, welcome back. We actually do have one more largely academic subject to get through before we move into the demonstrations and uh, examples, and that is file handling. So we're going to talk about that here as well as a brief look at how to export to SoundCloud, the naming conventions, and then also the uh, a quick review of what the loudness uh, standards are all about these days. So the first part of this, the file handling, is going to largely apply to you if you're a commercial operator doing uh, work for clients. If you're a if you're an independent uh, contributor working at home or working in your own facility on your own stuff, exactly where the files are and so forth, the particulars aren't is going to, that information isn't going to be as critical. But if you're doing work for a client where, say, after the project is complete, you need to expunge those files from your system or you need to bundle them and provide them back to the client and so forth, being able to find them is, is critical. And a, a WaveLab project is not one file. WaveLab is such a, a, a subtle and complex beast that it has, uh, it has stuff scattered all over the place. And uh, for example, here we're looking, looking at an audio montage, and the audio montage itself doesn't even contain the audio data. It simply references audio files that are stored elsewhere. So there are a couple of aspects of this to, to look at just so that you know where to find what you need. And we're going to go back to the file tab. And we touched on this just very briefly in the opening chapter. We're going to take a little deeper dive this time. Let's go down to the preferences uh, tab and then the folder sub tab. And what's important here is to look at just how many different folders WaveLab is using uh, in its architecture. And when you install WaveLab, it's going to go set these default folders up on your system. And it's, unless there's some compelling reason to change them, it's probably going to be easiest if you just leave the defaults in place because then it'll be uh, easy to find what you need. But you can click on any one of these and then you'll see the current folder path displayed over here to the right. And then you can, uh, you can open that folder. You can reveal it in the finder if you need to navigate directly to it, that sort of thing. But let's just review what each of these folders is, why it's there, and how you use it. Now, the first three are temporary folders. And WaveLab distinguishes between work folders and document folders. And work folders are where it's putting temporary files. So as you're actively recording, as you're editing and things, the, uh, the audio or the data that's in play is going to be held in a temporary location. And if you have multiple hard drives on your system, you can specify, you can locate a temporary folder file on each one of them, and it sort of helps spread out the workload. Uh, that's not the case on the rig you're looking at here, so they're all in the, the same place. You can tell the path name doesn't change there. And then you also have the companion files folder, and normally it's going to store that in the same place it stores the audio. And companion files are all of the, the little uh, extras about what you were working on that aren't, strictly speaking, part of the audio file itself. So zoom level and uh, you know where the cursor position was and all that stuff. The reason for those companion files is so that each time you open a piece of work back up, it looks like it did when you lost, last saw it. it. It comes back to where it was. But those companion files are normally going to be tucked into the same folder as the audio. But if you're in a situation where you need just one and not the other, uh, the, this allows you to distinguish between those two. And the last sort of special folder at the top here is the cache folder. And this is where it puts, WaveLab puts the... Uh, the temporary WAV files that it is generating from compressed or encoded files. So uh, if you're working with an MP3 file, for example, or a file that's been encoded in some way, some other format, whether that's FLAC or whatever, uh, what WaveLab is going to do is sort of unpack that, uh, convert it to a WAV file so that it can work with it inside its audio engine. And it needs a place to put that until it's done doing its, its magic. And that's what the cache folder does. It gives it a, a temporary place to unpack those uh, encrypted files or encoded files while it's, while it's doing the uh, active editing. But the uh, cache folder would just sort of fill up indefinitely uh, in that situation. So what you uh, have here is an option to determine how many days of uh, cache data it's going to save before it starts pushing stuff out the other side. And normally... Uh, Unless you're working with something classified or uh, you have some reason to want to uh, make sure that none of the ancillary parts are touched, you, you can sort of leave this at the default of 10 days. And then as the cache fills up, it's just going to push old data out the other side. But if for some reason you don't want it to do that, you have the option uh, to set this to whatever value uh, that you want there. So those are the, uh, the five sort of special folders at the top. And the rest of these, you have an open and a save folder default for uh, each of the different types of work that WaveLab can perform. 
And again, they're all, if you look at the uh, the path name here, and again, this is in a Mac environment where we've got users, then then my login, the documents folder, a WaveLab Pro folder, and then the name of the type of work that it's that it's doing. And you can see the batch process here. Both the open and save are going to the same place, and the audio CD, same thing. The and in one of these, you can open here and uh, reveal in the Finder and, and go right there if you need to pull stuff out and so forth and so on. Uh, the, the, I guess the most critical takeaway from this is that you know how to find where the actual file lives on your system should you need to uh, either remove it or uh, transmit it or what have you. And you can find with each of these different types, you can see that displayed in the path name there. And then notice at the bottom here, you also have an open and a save folder for the file group and for the project itself. But remember, the uh, it, if, you, if somebody says, if a client says, hey, or a uh, a coworker says, I, I need that, you know, the uh, ABC audio file project. Um, you can't just simply copy the project file by itself and email it or Dropbox it or what have you. Um, it's going to need all of the companion pieces that go with it. So this is how you can um, find all of that stuff. Now, as far as the audio files themselves are concerned, let's look at one other aspect of that. I'm going to move back to the... Uh, to the audio file editor itself, just to make sure we've got a solid waveform selected. Then back to the view tab and information. And of course, the info tab here is where you're going to do things like change names and uh, you can see where the file itself is stored and so on. But I want to point out two things. At the bottom, you have an option to copy to clipboard. If you click that, it's going to give you all of these options about that file, um, including you know where it's saved uh, all the way up to the entire audio information uh, docket here. So if you um, have a waveform, you select all of this, hit OK, it's going to copy it to clipboard. Then let's open uh, just a basic text editor and select the paste command, and you'll see that right there it's going to give you all that information in one shot. So if you have to extract that information and either archive it, index it, or give it to somebody, that's a very quick and easy way to do that, including, again, most probably most significantly is the, the path name to where it's at. Um, conversely, if somebody says, um, hey, I, I need you to go get rid of that file or I need you to send me that file, you can come right next door to the Reveal and Finder and uh, you'll have slightly different nomenclature in the Windows environment, but it's the same idea. You click that button and it's going to take you out to your, uh, your default navigational tool, file navigation tool, and it's going to drive you right to the location of that file in your system. And then from that point, you can do uh, whatever it is that you need to do with the file there. So in terms of handling these things, they are scattered all over the place, um, which is a necessary condition of a, a piece of software this complex, but that doesn't mean they're unmanageable. You just may have to go through sort of bit by bit and, and do that. Okay, the next thing I want to look at are saving and exporting options, and we've gone back to the audio editor here, and I'm going to open the file menu and take the option to uh, save as and point out a couple of things. First, you have the uh, the name of the file that you're going to save. That's pretty typical. And then the location. But there's this format window in the middle, and that's a little bit unusual. And uh, if you come down to the factory presets, you'll see that you have the option. Now, we're working in a, a WAV file. That's the default format for WaveLab. But you can save it into different bit resolutions. Um, you can open the encoded file and save it as an AAC, an MP3, FLAC, etc. And all of those uh, format changes can be done right here from the save function, which is actually uh, a great time saver and, and just frankly pretty cool. Then at the other end of that format line, you have this icon, Presets. If you click on that, uh, here again you open the, ed the, the factory presets, but you can open the editor. And this is going to give you even more control over all of those different uh, factors, including down here the metadata. Uh, you are going to have a default option to inherit that from the source file. And if you, uh, for example, if you want to scrub all of that off for some reason, um, you have the option to do that right there, especially um, if you're working with uh, client files back and forth and you're using metadata to communicate about editorial changes and things. And by the time you send the file to the client, you want a clean copy. Uh, this is, you could almost look at this as a way of uh, saving without markup in the, uh, the Microsoft Word world or the uh, PDF world. So you can, uh, you can use that to scrub off your metadata, or if you want to make sure that the metadata stays with it even after the file conversion, you've got that option there. So uh, let's look at the export command next. And the um, options here are also a little more sophisticated than normally. You can uh, select just part of your file to uh, 
to export just regions, all the regions and so forth, which can be handy um, in, say, a sound effects library where you've got every little snippet or piece, uh, you know, contained within its own region, or maybe for a Foley selection, you can send those, export them as, as individuals if that's going to be easier for the, uh, the next person downstream to uh, accommodate. The, uh, the results, you can, you can leave it as an unnamed, you can leave it where it was, or you can give it a specific name. And that brings us to this, which is the naming scheme. And if you um, open, the, uh, open the editor here for this, you can come down and uh, edit the um, actual composition of the name. Here we go, when it's done. That's what we're looking for, the naming scheme. Let me, I'm sorry, I flipped through that pretty quickly. The, uh, the name is going to be over here on the left side. The scheme is going to be uh, over on the right. And so if you don't make any other changes here, it's going to default to the unchanged name. And whatever you've entered on the left is what's going to be baked into the file when it's finished. If you uh, open this, you can do a lot of stuff. There are factory presets. So if you want to export it with a, a counter or a date stamp in addition to the name, that'll do it. Uh, but if you come up to the edit bar, this gets you the option to compose your own unique naming scheme. And at the moment, you can see it has simply the name value there because that's, that's all that, uh, that it uh, defaults to. But if you click Add Attribute, you can come down and select any of these variables down here to include, say, the date, the format that you'd like. You can add the time. And, of course, as you can tell by the, um, the fact that you've got all these custom variables here, uh, you can go in and create your own free text, all sorts of things, whether you want to use uh, the automatic stuff from the CD world, whether you want to put your own text in there. And then you can save that and have it available uh, in the future. So again, for uh, client names, for project names, things of that nature. And basic stuff here, you can determine what sort of separators, where you want your counter offset to begin, uh, all of that sort of thing. And then down at the bottom here, it's going to show you a preview. So uh, we have test file, which was the name, then the date and the time. If I say, well, you know, for this reason, for broadcast purposes, I want the time moved up here. Maybe I want the, you know, the date to apply in a different order. You can drag stuff around. The preview window is going to show you the, uh, the format when you're all done with it there. So uh, this is the sort of thing that is either going to be vitally critical to you or not at all. So for those of you for whom this is a big deal, obviously, if you get in here and work with it just a little bit, you'll very quickly realize how powerful the naming conventions are. And you can set up uh, whatever you need for your particular application. Now, the last thing I want to look at is a little more fun than functional. It's the export to SoundCloud option. And if you're not familiar, SoundCloud is a music sharing website uh, where you sign up with an account and then you can post material up there for others to hear and so forth. And Steinberg and SoundCloud have had a really close working relationship for a long time. So all of their other products interface with SoundCloud and uh, WaveLab does too. And it's just, it's a very efficient way to share material, uh, to park it on a website that anybody can get to from any device to preview stuff or listen to and what have you. Uh, it's actually a little more useful than you would think initially. But if you click the Export to SoundCloud dialog button here, the first thing that's going to happen is the uh, it's going to open your web browser, it's going to go to the SoundCloud page, and it's going to ask you to access it. Uh, and I should say, before this will work, you have to set up a SoundCloud account and enter the username and password, and then WaveLab remembers that. And if that's all correct, you can say, sure, hit connect, and uh, give everybody permission to do all the stuff. And then this is going to pop up, and it's going to start uploading the material in whatever format you specified uh, directly to SoundCloud. 